Hello everybody in the land of BC, it's Matt and I'm back to do another Rolling Stones album review. Been doing those in order of release and we'll get right to that in a second here. First off, a little bit of housekeeping. I wanted to say hello, do a shout out to Ross Marshall. Uh, Ross responded to my previous video for Goat's Head Soup and so thank you for the nice words. Ross, I'm glad you enjoy watching my videos glad somebody does so it's just nice to nice to get a, a, a pat on the back there didn't mean to ignore you a uh, reason I didn't respond to you is that I'm not sure why or how this happens but every once in a while 90% of the time if somebody responds to one of my videos I get it in my email and I get it on the uh, notification on my YouTube page either one of those I can just click reply it'll take me to their comments and I can say hi thank you or whatever response I give them but every once in a while when yours was one of these on the email I clicked reply it took me to my video but then your comment wasn't there so there I, there's nothing to reply to I don't know why it's not there on um, the YouTube page on the notification I click reply and it takes me not to your reply but to somebody else's so I don't know what's up there but I wasn't ignoring you but anyway thank you for the kind words uh, you had asked about said you should kind of surprised that I don't like Angie the song from Goat's Head Soup I don't know what to say I mean it's just you know, different strokes for different folks I guess I just the song always kind of grated on me and just was never a fan of it I know that it was a big hit I know a lot of people like it so if you're one of, if you like it, if other people like it, that's great. I'm not, you know, knocking the song or anything. Just never did anything to me. It's kind of a, uh, in my eyes, it's this the Stones version of my love. Maybe not quite as uh, sticky sweet and Barry Manilow-ish as that song. It's a little grittier than that, but it's not too far off. And it just, eh, it just doesn't do it for me. So, what, what can I say? Also, you asked about, because you pointed out that I've mentioned several times that I don't care much for music past the mid-80s, which is true with a, a few exceptions, but you asked if I like Oasis, Blur, and Pulp, three of the big Britpop bands from the 90s. I love Pulp. Only thing I've got by them is Different Class, which I, I need to get some of their other records because I've heard them and I do they're they're a good band they're they are really good I like them a lot blur some of their songs I like a lot a few of them uh, a lot of them I, I'm neither here nor there on so uh, there are they have some really good stuff but I, I do like a, a handful of their songs Oasis I don't know I tried and I tried a few times because it on paper sounds like a band that I should like and I would like and uh, they're not a terrible band but they just I, they just kind of leave me flat they really don't do anything for me uh, not knocking them I know they've got their fans and all that I'm not saying they're not talented but they're, they're okay I just just they just never really move me in the same vein as that not exactly Britpop bands but sort of uh, later post 80s bands that I like quite a bit my bloody valentine I'm a big fan of Bell and Sebastian Lydia Loveless some others so there are a few few bands from from uh, uh, post 1985 that I do like but anyway um, so yeah Ross thanks for, for, for that and now let's get to uh, the main topic here it's only rock and roll the Rolling Stones this came out October 18th, 1974. Went to number one in the United States, number two in England, which uh, broke a trend because all of their albums in England had hit number one, I think, going back to either Beggar's Banquet or Let It Bleed. So this failed to get number one in England. So last album with Mick Taylor. This is the, um, it was not the first album that Mick and Keith produced because they produced Satanic Majesty's Request back in 19. 67 but Jimmy Miller had produced all the Stones albums from Beggar's Banquet up through Goat's Head Soup uh, Key said they kind of felt like they got in a rut with him so 
so he's not producing this album making Keith step back in and handle the production duties you've got your in addition to the Rolling Stones you've got your uh, kind of usual um, usual crew who's been playing on the last five or so Rolling Stones albums you got Billy Preston, Nicky Hopkins, uh, Ian Stewart of course Andy Johns and so forth and so they all show up and do their part and it's always a plus when you've got Preston and Hopkins and those other guys around so that's a good thing so the cover this was um, did I write that guy's name down I don't know if um, yeah the guy, guy's name is Guy Peel Peelhart or Peel Art not sure I'm sure I'm not saying that correct but he had done a book called Rock Dreams I remember back in the 70s when I was a kid seeing that in the bookstores all the time and it's a bunch of pictures that are sort of this type of art so Mick saw that and there's a in that book there's a picture of the Rolling Stones not this one but Mick was uh, impressed with that and asked him to do the cover so you've got the Rolling Stones as sort of these Greek or Roman uh, deities or at least important people here at this I guess Greek Roman temple descending the stairs well well tons of ladies look on adoringly and lovingly and worship worshipfully so you got all these uh, ladies in togas uh, I guess going to a toga party at the Delta house after this but anyway they're uh, quite uh, smitten with the stones there and Mix coming down the stairs all cocky looking followed by the rest of the stones down there at the bottom you've got these little girls so uh, that's either uh, kids that the Rolling Stones had with these ladies or they're there so that uh, Bill Wyman can get a date too I guess on the back you've got the steps of the uh, Roman temple whatever that is some Hoodlum has graffitied It's Only Rock and Roll, the title of the album on the back wall there. So that's the cover. It's it's uh it's alright. Same guy that did this did Diamond Dogs, the David Bowie album cover. I think that came out after that. That was a seventy five or something album, if I'm not mistaken. Inner sleeve, you got Billy Preston and Ian Stewart, Nicky Hopkins picture there. On the other side you just have the track listing and some of the information about what's on the album. So, this was supposed to be, originally, a part live album and a part covers album, but they wrote songs and so that sort of didn't work out. There's no live tracks on this album. There's one cover song. They recorded several that I think have been, I don't know if they've ever been released officially. I think they've been bootlegged. But, so there's one cover on this, no live. The rest of it's newly written material though some of the songs date back a couple of years that they didn't use on um, Goat's Head Soup maybe even Exile on Main Street that show up on here a lot of this album was recorded in Germany and I guess some of it in England too which is interesting I don't think I said that before but it's interesting the Beatles never recorded outside of England with the exception of I think Can't Buy Me Love was recorded in France and obviously my Bonnie early on was in Germany but everything else they recorded in in England and the Stones even back in the 60s were known to record in Chicago Los Angeles they recorded a lot of stuff in England of course too but and then you know exile a lot of that was recorded in France some of goat's head soup in Jamaica some of this in Germany so they always sort of got around and recorded other places I just thought that was kind of interesting maybe you do too probably not but anyway just a little bit of stones and beetle trivia there so this album besides the, a couple of hits that still show up pretty often on classic rock radio is kind of been it didn't get very good reviews when it came out like goat's head and like the album that comes out after this black and blue but this is sort of, with the exception of the title track and one other track, pretty much a forgotten album in some ways, I think. It, it, it's, uh, you know, people don't think of it the way they think Sticky Fingers, Exile, Some Girls, things like that. So 
kind of overlooked and forgotten, even though it was the number one album at the time. But uh, that's okay. I, I like this album. I think, I actually like this better than I do Goat's Head Soup, which has its moments. But it's kind of a druggy, dark, sleazy, decadent. A uh, lot of the songs on here are four to six minutes, so a lot of long songs. There's two or three songs that are like three minutes, but most of these are pretty long songs. It, you can kind of see why punk rock, which blew up a year or two after this, is sort of a, a counter to the dinosaur rock kind of albums like this played right into that as to what spurred punk to some degree but it's still it's a good album and I think a lot of these albums and a they're not as good as their albums in the 60s or the early 70s and things like Sticky Fingers and Exile it, they're just not but they're still really good and just like the solo Beatles and for the most part the Rolling Stones in the 70s a lot of good stuff but whereas in the 60s Stones and the Beatles were breaking new ground and setting the trends. In the 70s, um, a lot of times they're just sort of following the trends instead of setting the trends. Doesn't mean they're not making great music, but you know, they're sort of, uh, instead of uh, out front there calling the shots and setting the trends, they're following the trends, sort of the responding to things like the 70s rock song, sound and dance music and reggae and disco and so forth. But, um, you know, not necessarily bad. And, and I think the reason a lot of these albums, the early solo Beatles albums in a lot of cases and the Stones albums in the mid-70s got the critical and in a lot of cases fan uh, negative reactions is that uh, they were so close to their, you know, their magical highlight purple patch period of the 60s that it was probably impossible to see these in their own standing and not at that time compare them to what had come before back in the 60s and now all these years later we can look at these albums just on their own and and I think when you do that they hold up a lot better than they did to people back when they came out also the interesting thing in this album is in my mind you might disagree but there's really no standout hit track which is kind of funny because there were two singles released from this record and both of them got a lot of radio play both of them still do but I'll get to those songs and why I'm saying that but even though there's not um, the standout hit track in my mind there are some just really great deep cut solid tracks just good listening put this album on and listen to almost all of it there's a couple of dogs on here, but pretty good album to just listen to front to back and some great deep cuts and and nice groove to the album. I really do like this album, but anyway, let's see. Let's get on to the tracks here. There's even a bonus track we'll talk about. Uh, da, 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 da. So side one opens with If You Can't Rock Me which if you can't rock me somebody will Keith plays bass on that really good face this is a mix singing about if uh, if you don't give me what I want I can get it from someone else whether he's just singing to um, uh, the fans or Bianca or girls in general or whatever it's a good opening it's it's got a nice groove to it it's not the strongest opening by any means it's not in the same class with uh, Gimme Shelter or uh, you know sympathy for the devil or anything like that it's um, but it's still it's got a good groove and a really nice bass guitar part by Keith which is like I said already kind of surprising nice song though it's a pretty good opener and it's a good uh, it, it's uh, not it was not released as a single and it's it's close but not quite up to par uh, single quality but it's right there, almost right there, and it's it's a good groove. It's a nice rocker. Uh, like I said, it's not like Rock Soft opens uh, Exile, which is a, a great song. This is a near great song with a really good groove. 
I like it though. I'm going to give if you can't rock me an 8.5. It does stick in your head and and it's a it's a it's a pretty decent opener. Next one is the cover, the soul cover song on this album, which is Aren't Too Proud to Beg. Of course, the Temptations back in 1966 did this originally. Uh, this is a good, you know, the Stones were always pretty good cover band and this is no exception. They do a really good job here. The the um, couple of their covers in the 70s, one of them's coming up on an album, a couple of two or three albums down the road, but would be my favorite of their 70s covers. So this is one of them. I think uh, they don't match the Temptations version, but they come pretty close, and it, it's a really good, uh, it, they don't change things around too much. It's a pretty straightforward cover, but they do it well. And Aren't You Proud to Beg, I'm gonna give it a nine. Now we go with the lead single off of the album and the title track it's only rock and roll which surprisingly only got to number 16 in the united states i looked it up i, I would have thought it would have got higher and it got to number 10 in england this came out uh, like i said in october so i would have been in fifth grade and i remember and you know whatever i was in fifth grade to 11 or 12 i remember the song being all over the radio like crazy when it came out and then of course it's been played to death since then on classic rock so kind of a strange because the rest of this album even though some of these songs date back but most of these songs were recorded roughly around the same time and some of them were written new for the album it's only rock and roll is sort of a separate thing from the album in that ron wood ronnie wood who would become a rolling stone here right after this had been in the faces he wanted to do a solo album i think it's called i've got my own album to do he called upon mick taylor to help out with some guitar parts on the album and then the damn thing froze again uh but anyway so mick taylor helped him out and somewhere in there mick jagger showed up to hang out uh, Kenny Jones was there who was the drummer in the faces and was later the drummer in the who for a short time after Keith Moon died uh, David Bowie showed up and they were just jamming and messing around Jagger and Bowie and uh, Ronnie Wood and, and uh, Kenny Jones and so forth and they came up sort of with the with the um, um, just the riff for its only rock and roll and they recorded that or just roughly recorded it I think they ended up keeping the rhythm section of Kenny Jones, Ron Woods on there, and um, I don't know that David Bowie, I don't think he's on the, but, and then Keith Richards came in and uh, later on put the guitar parts on here. So it's kind of a Frankenstein of a song, but it, it worked out. And Mick Taylor's actually not on here on this song which surprised me because for a long time I figured that was his guitar bits on there uh, anyway as, as Rolling Stone uh, hits or classics go I always love the guitar bit that's a that's a good great uh, neat thing on the song the rest of the songs kind of pedestrian though it, it's it's uh, good enough but it's not it's not great it's not Honky Tonk Woman, Gimme Shelter, Bitch, Brown Sugar, you know, quality. It's it's okay. It's, it's sort of a, I always found it to be a little bit meh of a song, even though I do love the guitar parts. But, yeah, I'll give it a seven. It, uh, it's probably a lot of people would rate that higher, and so be it. But anyway, a seven for the title track. Funny thing is, that was released as a 45, like I said, and it had a B-side called Through the Lonely Nights, which was not on the album and wasn't on any album at all until I think later on it showed up on some compilation rarities albums, but never on a proper Rolling Stones album. Through the Lonely Nights, a, a great, it's just a great aching, slightly country-ish rock slice of uh, longing and sadness. And a really good song should have been on the album. There's a couple of these songs on here they could have easily taken off and replaced Through the Lonely Nights with. And I'd give that one a nine. So that's worth checking out on YouTube or tracking down the single or finding one of those compilation albums that has it. So, but 
back to the album proper, the next song on side one, fourth song on side one, till the next time we say goodbye. I love this song. This is a good one. It's a nice song. Jagger sings with that sort of slightly affected goofy voice that he uses sometimes. But the funny thing is, is that he sounds genuine on the song, which he usually doesn't open up much or, or you know, sound sincere. So he's kind of singing in this affected voice through parts of the songs, goofy voice, but really sincere, nice uh, world weary ballad, kind of a country feel too, quite descriptive in the lyrics, and uh, just a nice good uh, ballad, affecting ballad by the Stones, good album cut, like I said this album's full of nice deep album cuts, wish this thing would unfreeze. But anyway, uh, till next time we say goodbye, gets a nine. Fifth song, and that, that's the last song on side one, I believe. It's, uh, yes, is Time Waits for No One. It's a jagger in a reflective mood again. Hours like diamonds, so don't waste them. Uh, compare this to Time is on My Side, which had come out just ten years earlier when they're, you know, young and think they've got all the time in the world even though that song's kind of also about time is on my side for getting back to a girl who did me wrong, but still, it's, um, this is a, a more world-weary, more realistic view of uh, time passing quickly and mortality. Uh, ballad, a little bit of a 70s soft rock feel to it early on in the song. It's another long song, uh, but... I love the, at the end, there's sort of the click, 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 sounds like a metronome, like a clock ticking, like the seconds ticking away, that runs for uh, several seconds at the very end of the song, and just that only. Also, Mick Taylor, good guitar player, really good guitar player, but kind of, um, I don't know, uh, I always liked him, but I always thought he was more technique than soul. It, with a few exceptions, and this is one of them. This is one of his best ballad, best uh, guitar solos, that is to say, truly soul-stirring, truly get the grit and the feel and the heart and the soul in his guitar solo that winds out the song, and it's, it's a long solo that sort of rides out the song, and uh, so it's really, I think, one of his best guitar solos, and uh, so yeah, kudos for that. Um, so yeah time waits for no one I'm going to give that an 8 we turn the album over and we open with Luxury Mick singing about third world inequality kind of funny it's a band trying to do reggae it's okay uh, lyrically you look at some of this stuff you'd think they were trying to be The Clash uh, two or three years before The Clash was actually a thing uh it's okay groove, but it's a, kind of a boring song. Five minutes long, it feels like it's ten minutes long. It's, uh, they'll do some reggae stuff on subsequent, on the next album, and uh, a little better maybe than here. Luxury is okay, I'm gonna give it a five, it's no big deal. Second song, Dance Little Sister Dance, this was another, this was, um, um, the flip side of the second single from the album, which was Ain't Too Proud to Beg, was the second single from the album. Dance Little Sister Dance was the flip side of that. Still gets a lot of, still, there we go. Stupid. Buy a new computer that's a lot more expensive than the old one, and then it freezes up when you're making a video where the old one did, and it's technology for you. you gotta love it. Anyway, Dance Little Sister Dance, a lot of radio play to this day. Uh, grinding Little Rocker. It's repetitive. The first half of the song, the repetitiveness sort of bothers me because it's kind of boring. The second half of the song, it picks up and it gets better. It's a generic driving rocker, but it's okay. I'm going to give it a 6.5. Uh, uh, it's one of their well-known songs, but it was uh, not one I ever go to seek out on purpose but when I hear it it's 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 a it's a fair nice little rocker so 6.5 third song is if you really want to be my friend another uh, 
another instance of Jagger being heartfelt and sincere to some degree, or he seems like he's being anyway. Uh, he's singing to Rolling Stones fans. He's singing to Bianca Jagger, maybe. Maybe he's singing to Keith or the critics. I don't know. But either way, it's got that nice sort of immersive, watery sound in piano, which I always like that song. Kind of a melancholy love song. Uh, compare this, the piano tone in this, to Beechwood Park by the Zombies on the great Odyssey and Oracle album from 1968, which also has a bit of that kind of watery piano. In that case, the Beechwood Park is a happier, more positive, upbeat even though it's still a bittersweet looking back and longing song uh, but this one's a more downbeat song so it's kind of funny how you could have kind of the same t instrument tone but relay different uh, moods and feelings but works really good in both of the songs Beechwood Park's the better song than this but this song's really good and I'm going to give it a 9 it's up there so um, not reviewing Zombies albums right now, but if I were, I'd give Beachwood Park a 10 in case you're interested. Now, uh, where I was talking about um, where they could have um, where they could have uh, used Through the Lonely Nights on the album, and they could have could have uh, Deep Six to a couple of the cuts on this album. This is the one they really should have because it's crap. And it's the fourth song on side two. It's Short and Curly's. This is a song that was recorded back around um, Goat's Head Soup time. And they didn't use it on that wisely, but they revived it for this. And it probably should have never been released. It should have been, if anything, a bonus track. And if they ever do a deluxe edition of this, probably not even that. Or just something that maybe was maybe bootlegged, or better yet, something where they just erase the tape, because it's it's the the Stone '70s silly cock rock, dumbed down, shock value track. Uh, the lyrics are stupid. If the music was good, it might make up for it a little bit, but it's just sort of a bluesy, by the numbers bar rock, piano driven snoozer of a song. Uh, thankfully it's short it's only 2 minutes and 43 seconds so it's the shortest song on the album but it's uh, at that it's about 2 minutes and 42 seconds too long so Short and Curly's is shitty and crappy and I'm going to give it a 2 pretty garbage song anyway but we do end the album on a high note and I think probably my favorite song on the album, Fingerprint File, which uh, is funny because I had not listened to this album in a long time. I've, I've had it. Uh, well, this is a newer copy, but I've, I've had uh, the album since way back when I was a kid and I always did pretty much enjoy it, but I knew I was going to have to listen to it because it was coming up in the line of the reviews. But even before that, I watched The Serpent on... Um, on uh, Netflix series on Netflix good show should check it out if you haven't it stars the wonderful beautiful super talented Jenna Coleman and they use fingerprint files in the first episode it's I think it's like eight episodes but uh, the scene where they use that with uh, her walking down the street with the the guy that plays the serial killer guy and uh, so fingerprint print files is playing just works perfectly and I'm always going to associate that now with the beautiful Jenna Coleman same way that I um, associate the Cars song moving in stereo to Phoebe Cates coming out of that swimming pool and fast times at Richmond High but anyway uh, yeah check out the serpent if you haven't definitely and enough on the Jenna Coleman stuff but uh, so that that uh, had me listen to the album and just reminded me how much I really like some of this album and really love some of the songs including this one it's a great it's just a a funk dance haze just a sticky sweaty uh, murky soul stew soup of goodness and wonder and Jagger's lyrics about being paranoid and chased around and followed by the FBI 
some little jerk in the FBI caping papers on me six feet high. I like that part, the, the lyric and the musical singing part. So, I don't know, this is the age of Watergate. Maybe he's singing about John Lennon because this would have been the time when Lennon was having his immigration uh, uh, fight going on there. And uh, it's just, just a, and then you've got the Mick, uh, the good night, sleep tight parts at the end. You've got this loopy, looping bass that's really great throughout the song. Just a, just a soulful, funky dance track and just a great song. Uh, mix a little ack ack and scat singing is, is pretty fun and pretty funny and it's a great song uh, best song on the album I'd say I'm going to give that one a 10 I think that's the only song on here that I gave a 10 to but um, I don't know maybe that could have been a, a, a single I'm not sure but it's definitely a great deep album track and it goes on for 6 minutes and 33 seconds and I would mind if it would have gone on for 12 minutes and whatever seconds so great song the album is not as good as their 60s stuff like I said but I think it's pretty solid it's enjoyable I'm going to give it a 7.9 and uh, there's some albums coming after that that are better than this there are definitely albums before this that were better but kind of a forgotten song forgotten album outside of the title track and Dance Little Sister Dance and um uh, maybe I'm too proud to beg but um, some good deep album cuts uh, unfortunately the crappy short and curlies but yeah it's worth checking out if you haven't and, and if it's uh, one that you heard back in the 70s if you were around and you didn't like it it's worth a revisit because you might find that it's not so bad after all anyway I'll be back with uh, black and blue when I get around to it so Take care, everybody. Stay out of the heat. Have fun and keep smiling.